it's yeah it's so, perfect yeah good day everybody um, uh, people are there from all over the world i can see from the attendee list so uh, critical transitions in complex system seminar series or webinar series is being jointly hosted by IIT Madras India and PIC, that is Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research Germany. This seminar series brings together experts in from fields such as climate science, combustion, neuroscience, fluid mechanics, etc., and aims to disseminate the state of the art in the prediction of critical transitions in these diverse fields of study. So the seminar takes place every month on the last Monday of every month. Okay, so please mark your calendars. Before introducing the speaker, a, a few housekeeping notes. I request everyone to turn off their microphones. Uh, please use the Q&A box or question and answer box in Zoom to ask the speaker your questions. You can type your questions in and speaker will answer them at the end. Uh, so with this, I turn over to uh, Professor Kurtz who will introduce the speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, Sujit, for the very clear words. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce today to you Professor Ulrike Feudel. Uh, I suppose that many of you know her. Uh, she studied and got her PhD at the Humboldt University in Berlin, made then habilitation at the University of Potsdam, had then uh, some rather stay as a postdoc in Maryland University, and then uh, got a full professorship at the University of Oldenburg. And uh, she got several awards, mainly to mention, from my perspective, the Richardson Award uh, from uh, European Geoscience Union, which uh, she got last year. Uh, other awardees were, were, for instance, Mandelbrot and such people, a really high-level award. And Ulrike is a very uh, well-known specialist in various deep bifurcation problems. And especially uh, she got important results on strange non-chaotic attractors, uh, on multi-stability extreme events. And uh, these days more shifted her interest to tipping and critical transitions and applications. And if I understand correctly, this will be the main uh, topic of your talk today. Please Ulrike, you have the floor. So thank you very much for the nice introduction. And now I'm sharing my screen so that we can start. We can see it. So you can see it, okay. So, but I will make it full screen. Okay, good. So uh, as already announced, uh, so the topic I'm talking about are tipping phenomena and resilience in complex systems. I would like to talk about theory and applications mainly devoted to climate science. And this is joint work with uh, Lukas Hallekotte, Sarah Schönmarkers and Anna Wanzelo, who are PhD students or say former PhD students of mine, Sebastian Vizorek from the University College Cork in Ireland, and Balint Kossage and Tamas Teel from the Edwards uh, Lorang uh, University in Budapest. Now, when we think about uh, tipping phenomena in nature, so then I will give you just as an introduction and motivation for our work, uh, some examples, so which are in the discussion already for quite a long time. So you see, uh, this tipping uh, phenomena business, so to say, this kind of research has started already in the 90s, last century. So, uh, and the importance of this kind of phenomena is particularly when we look at uh, natural phenomena in climate. And the examples I have chosen are uh, from exactly this area. So on the left, so to say, you see here, uh, this is a, a cartoon picture, if you like, so from the thermohaline ocean circulation, a large circulation uh, in the Atlantic, or it's over, all over the world, but the most important part, at least for Europe, is the Atlantic part, uh, which is um, density-driven circulation, which transports heat from the uh, warmer climate uh, uh, in the south, uh, to the north and then the heat is basically released to the atmosphere and uh, therefore we have a rather warm uh, climate in north and western Europe 
compared to um, to cities or to locations at the same latitude in Canada. But uh, so there is a certain threat uh, for this kind of circulation to break down as it has been in the past. Uh, so in um, so in the ice ages, basically before the Holocene. And uh, so this breakdown of the thermohaline ocean circulation would be one of the tipping phenomena. So which would affect uh, hard, uh, so very strongly Europe because of the cooling, not the warming. So even though it the cause is global warming, but uh, there could be a cooling in Northern and Western Europe due to a breakdown of this circulation. So this means we have two states here which are possible. So one, the heat transfer from the South to the North is on and the other one it's off. There is a part of this uh, thermohaline ocean circulation where the deep water is, so to say, uh, um, the deep water is formed in the ocean. That means the, the, um, the water gives up the heat to the atmosphere, changes its density and sinking down to a very large depth. And so this is called the deep water convection. And so this is another system where we have two states uh, where it can be uh, on this heat transfer uh, to the atmosphere and sinking down of the water, but it can also be off, which has been already observed uh, in nature. It's also a kind of bistable system, and this would be another tipping. So in ecology, so this is also known. So we see a cartoon picture here of two states of a shallow lake, so which could be a clear water state uh, with lots of biodiversity, lots of uh, animals here and plants, particularly plants on the bottom of the lake. But there is a turbid state where all these plants are basically removed uh, since they die uh, due to the large concentration of green algae, which would basically uh, block the light to go to the uh, plants here and the plants cannot survive. But one would also see in other areas in ecosystems changes in the dominance of different species as here, so to say, uh, this dominance change, this is also data. Uh, so where certain crabs have taken over the dominance in a benthic ecosystem. Now, when we think about this uh, tipping phenomenon, then there we have a very long history of, uh, of research in this area. And uh, even though this has been basically um, um, introduced the kind of uh, term regime shift in ecology and the term of tipping points in climate. So these phenomena are much older in, and uh, studied in mathematics where we would call it instability. So these are three different names for the same kind of uh, phenomena, but uh, so they are slightly different in their uh, definition. For the moment, we would like to understand it as a relatively uh, sudden change of a system state under the influence of changes in environmental conditions or external forcing. And usually this is related with the crossing of the threshold. In general, we would talk about critical transitions in this case as the whole series of seminars here. So there is another concept which has developed uh, in ecology also already in the last century, mainly by Holling. So he was one of the main figures in developing it. And this is the concept of resilience. And so he was understanding uh, uh, as resilience, the return of a system to its original state after a perturbation. And so we would like to um, address here, so to say, um, two different questions mainly. And one of them is, so how do we deal with highly multistable systems? The examples we have seen so far are all bistable. So we have two different stable states. So for instance, thermohaline ocean circulations on or off. And what is the role of the time scales? And time scales are extremely important. And I will uh, talk about this in more detail uh, because uh, so when we think about climate change, then we have to think about the intrinsic dynamics of any ecosystem, 
parts of the climate uh, system, but we have also to think about what are the drivers on which time scales the drivers are, and this interaction is quite important when we think about tipping phenomena. So therefore, we have to search for tipping uh, also in non-autonomous systems, and I will tell you a little bit so how this works. And when we think about resilience, so then Holling was saying that this is the response to a perturbation. So he is looking for the response of a perturbation, whether there is a qualitative change or there is no qualitative change, which would be, so to say, uh, the, uh, the question of whether there is a tipping or there is no tipping. But what kind of perturbations we can think of? So there is, of course, different types of perturbations uh, which are around, and one of them would be fluctuations, of course, which are inevitable in nature. There could be shocks. That means these are perturbations which are on a very short time scale. So they hit the system at once. They are not um, small perturbations. And there are trends. And this is what we see in climate change. For instance, we have trends of, uh, of changing uh, basically the mean temperature, the content uh, in CO2 in the atmosphere. So this happens on a certain time scale. And now the time scale discussion comes into play. So because these trends have one time scale, but our system, which has to deal with these perturbations, so is acting on a different time scale. And the response of the system can be different because it can tolerate this kind of uh, uh, perturbation. It can adapt to it or it can transform and react in a completely different way so that we might have only one state, for instance, as this example here shows, after the perturbation and we finally end up with a system which was bistable before, but it is not bistable any further. Now, what is important in this talk is the concept of multistability, which is for most of you probably known. And uh, so here is just a picture. So what are the main ingredients when we are talking about multistability? And so this is a system which has several stable states. So they are coexisting and in terms of ecosystems. So this could be, for instance, the composition of species, spatial patterns. But this is for fixed environmental parameters or for fixed forcing. This is a typical uh, property of nonlinear systems. In linear systems, you would see only one of these stable states and multistability would be absent. But <clears throat> so what is an important concept uh, as well is the basin of attraction. And this means which of the stable alternative states here, alternative when we have only two, will be realized in the long-term limit. This depends strongly on the, the initial conditions. So if we think about this ball here, so which is just here on the hill, so this can roll to both sides so that everything what's left of this red ball would basically be all the initial conditions which would um, end up in this stable state and on the other side to the other stable state. That means the basin of attraction is the set of all initial conditions which all would converge to the same state. Now, now let me um, tell you a little bit about properties of these um, basins of attraction. They can be of two different kinds. We can have smooth basins of attraction and we can have fractal basins of attraction. So for the smooth basins of attraction, we see, so to say, that we have here smooth manifolds which are separating the two basins of attraction. But on the other hand, it can be much more complicated because it could be so that we have complexly interwoven basins of attraction due to their fractal nature. And we see that these basins of attraction or these attractors here, which are the stars here, and the different colors denote, so to say, the sets of initial conditions which converge to this star here and to this star here. And we see that the minimal perturbation we would need here in this case is much smaller than in this case. And when we are outside with our perturbation, then we cannot even decide which color we will hit and therefore to which, um, and to which attractor or this long-term state, the system will converge. Now, when we come back to our perturbations, so then all of them, so to say, are possible 
um, to, uh, to be applied, so to say, to a certain system and look for the response. But all these perturbations act in a different way, and it can also dict on, uh, um, uh, act on different components of the system. The impact is quite different, and therefore we have carefully to, dis to distinguish uh, the, the uh, different perturbations to see what the impact is. And when we think about the bistable systems I, what I was talking about in the very beginning for a motivation, and what I showed with this kind of cartoon picture with this stability landscape. So then we can, we can uh, now visualize this by stability here in this uh, kind of a bifurcation diagram where we have two stable states, the red and the blue. So they depend on a certain parameter or external forcing. This would be a state variable. So you can suppose in the simplest case, this could be fixed points here. Uh, so which are uh, which are here the attractive sets, so the stable sets in the long-term limit. And so you see here at one, two, and three, the, the different stability landscapes, which would correspond to these parameter values. So we have this region of bistability here. And if we are beyond this region, then there is monostability, only one of the states is left. And here we have this kind of double well potential so which is also different, say, in terms of the depth of the valleys in these different, um, uh, for these different parameter values. Now, when we think about perturbations, they can, of course, act in different ways because they can either act on the state variables. So this would be, so to say, the vertical here. And they could also act on the parameters. So we can change the parameters. So in a perturbation, for instance, with a trend, or we can, uh, or we can uh, change the state variables. Uh, so either with fluctuations or say with this kind of shocks. And the outcome is quite different. And this is what I would like to talk about. Now let's think about, uh, so what types of um, uh, transitions are possible. So, so since I said that this kind of research is already quite old, uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to say something about the classical ones, but only shortly. Because, of course, when we look at this kind of diagrams that we know that this is a bifurcation diagram, and there are these certain points here, these limit points or saddle node bifurcations, where a bifurcation is happening. And that means if we are changing parameters or external forcing, then we can cross this cliff here and get to this other stable state by just moving over the cliff and falling down to the other stable state. So this would be a bifurcation. We are changing the stability landscape basically, and this is called a B-tipping. Now we can also have noise on the system when we, are, we have a bistable system and this noise would also kick the system over this, um, this hill here and end up in this state, but this is dependent on the noise strength. So with a certain noise realization, we can kick the system over the hill and land in another state. So this is also a classical transition, which has been uh, studied already for a very long time. So therefore I would like to focus more on the other two. Uh, and uh, so this is a shock tipping, which is a result of a single large perturbation, the shock, or even an extreme event in nature. So this is basically a perturbation which kicks us over the basin boundary. And so the fourth one is the environmental parameters change faster than the system can track its stable state. And this is the so-called R-tipping or rate-induced tipping where the parameter changes with a trend. So for the classical ones, I just want to mention two examples, so to say, from, uh, from the climate science. So one is the thermohaline ocean circulation, which I took already as a uh, motivation. And so the bifurcation parameter here is uh, the freshwater input, which is changing the density. And since it's a density-driven circulation, so this freshwater input can have a dramatic impact 
And uh, during climate change, it could lead to a collapse of the thermohaline ocean circulation. This has been found already uh, so in the 90s, and one can uh, use here global ocean circulation models to show this kind of decline. One can also use conceptual models where the breakdown comes uh, uh, through a bifurcation, and it can be either the saddle node bifurcation is here, or there is even um, hop bifurcation, which is subcritical, so that the thermohaline ocean circulation can break down. But what is important here to note is that if we are looking at bifurcation diagrams, we have always to keep in mind that we are changing our parameter very, very slowly because we are assuming that we are just moving along this branch in the bifurcation diagram. And this means it takes a long time. The dissipation has to bring us always back after a perturbation to this branch here. And therefore, so here the parameter uh, changes are extremely slow. Now for the uh, noise induced uh, transition, we can think about the deep ocean convection, which we have also seen already in the motivation. And for this, you can also, because it's again a density uh, driven um, uh, effect, because it's again the density, so which uh, leads to either a stable stratification of the ocean or to a convection event where we have a mixing uh, so of more denser water, which is then on the top, so to the bottom of the ocean. So this, uh, so this switching can result from fluctuations in temperature and freshwater input so that we can have a noise-induced transition. But with a noise induced transition, we cannot look at the bifurcation diagram. So because it doesn't tell us much about it because we are far away from a bifurcation usually. But what we have to keep in mind is so to say the meantime, it would be needed. So for the noise to kick the system out of the stable state. And this mean escape time depends on the barrier. So which we have to overcome. So this is just this height here. And of course, on the noise strength. So the stronger the noise, the faster it goes. And uh, the, the higher the barrier, the slower it goes. And when we look at the uh, mean time, so to say, where convection is on or the convection is off, so this would be convection, this would be uh, no convection. And if we then look at uh, climate change, then we see that these. Um, mean frost passage times or these mean escape times are, <clears throat> are increasing with global warming. Um, and that means we would stay much, much longer. Uh, so when in non-convection state and therefore in weakening uh, the thermohaline ocean circulation uh, in this noise induced transition. So, but let me now come to the uh, measures of resilience, so which Holling has introduced, because he talked about engineering resilience, which is the stability with uh, respect to small perturbation, which is just linear stability theory. But he also talked about ecological resilience, and this is the stability with respect to large perturbations. And you can translate it also, so to say the other way around and say this is the smallest perturbation which is necessary to leave the current ecosystem state. And so in mathematical terms, this means that we have to compute the smallest distance to the basin boundary. And this would be in our picture before the distance here to the boundary of the basin of attraction, either in the, in the smooth case or in the um, fractal case here. Oh, sorry. So, and so this is simple for, uh, for say, um, low dimensional systems here. But for high dimensional systems, this is a real challenge. But it's possible to do. And uh, so uh, one can develop an optimization scheme because you cannot probe all the directions. So, what is the smallest distance uh, to the uh, to the basin boundary. So therefore you need an optimization scheme and this optimization scheme, uh, so which we have introduced here to look at this smallest distance to the basin 
um, to the boundary of the basin of attraction. So this is basically inspired by a totally different um, by a totally different method. So which has been developed in hydrodynamics, uh, where people look at the smallest seed or the minimal seed, how you can switch from a laminar to a turbulent motion. And this idea, so in, in, a, in a turbulent state, so you go from a laminar to a turbulent motion in hydrodynamics, this is a very high dimensional system. So one can also do this kind of optimization here. Uh, so to get this kind of vector here, and this gives you not only, so to say, the amount of perturbation what you need, but it gives you also the direction. And this is very uh, important to think about. And uh, so this is, uh, I would like to demonstrate with a certain, uh, with a certain example, which uh, gives us uh, an idea, so to say, how this minimal perturbation can look like. And we would like to look at, um, at uh, networks, so which are basically pollinator networks, plants and pollinators which are interacting. And this is a high dimensional system because these systems are usually having lots of plants uh, and lots of animals which are interacting. These are the nodes and the edges are the mutualistic interactions because these plants and, and, so, and the pollinators are act interacting with each other to their mutual benefit. And so what the outcome is, this is now, so to say, um, examples, so to say, which we have seen uh, for one of uh, many networks one can study in nature also because there is a wonderful, um, wonderful website where you can get all these plant pollinator network topologies, but this is the most vulnerable one. So, and we can now compute what is the minimal perturbation and what is also the direction. So the minimal perturbation is now, so to say, uh, encoded because it's a high dimensional vector in terms of colors uh, to see what the magnitude is. And uh, so we see also uh, the kind of uh, direction because there is a positive perturbation to this kind of tree-like structures and mainly a negative perturbation to the core of the network. And what we see is basically what happens after we apply this kind of, uh, of what we call the minimal fatal shock, because fatal means really these plants and these pollinators, they die out if we uh, apply this perturbation. And we see, so to say, that uh, so after applying this perturbation, some of these states are basically, uh, some of these um, um, species are dying out, go to zero as we see, and only a part of the network is left. So when we now look at uh, different networks, we see that these kind of perturbations can be very different. So when we compare so to say, the magnitude which we need to uh, make these systems um, going into another state where certain species die out, we see that this is very different and depends crucially on the topology. And we see that the most vulnerable parts of these kind of plant pollinator networks are certain um, tree-like structures here or even only specialized um, animals here which are only um, which are only, so to say, dependent on one plant which die out because all the species which are here under the yellow ground, so to say, they will die out when we apply the minimal perturbation. So that means that topology is a very important ingredient to see what type of, um, of vulnerability we, we would see and what are the most vulnerable either species or even topological structures in these kind of networks. And one of the things which come out, of course, which is known, of course, to ecologists already, that specialization is quite dangerous. If you have only one partner for your mutualistic growth, then this is quite dangerous. But we will also have, so to say, these tree-like structures, which are the most dangerous ones. But you can also uh, apply this type of uh, ideas to say power grids and look 
so how vulnerable are single nodes even on this kind of um, networks? And this is the great power grid of Great Britain. And we see here a little bit, uh, so to say, zoomed in. And we have applied uh, this type of ideas. So we can also do the same kind of thing to single nodes, to parts of the networks and so on. And uh, so we applied it now to single nodes and see that if we apply perturbations to these single nodes, we see that we have fractal basin boundaries. So that method works also for fractal basin boundaries. And in these fractal basin boundaries, there is a chaotic saddle which is embedded in the basin boundary. And that means after the perturbation, we cannot even make a prediction to which of the states so uh, our system will converge. So that means the desynchronization, which happens afterwards, uh, can either affect only, so to say, some nodes which are in the neighborhood of the perturbed one. So this would be this black one, but it can be also far away. And in the worst case, it can be a perturbation of whole Scotland in Great Britain. Now let me come to the last example of the rate-induced tipping. So what does it mean? So when we think about rate-induced tipping, then we are thinking about a perturbation, which is just um, getting now uh, into this business of different time scales. So what does it mean we have a rate-induced tipping? So as I explained in the very beginning, so when we look at the bifurcation diagram, so then we also change a parameter and we change it very, very slowly so that we will more or less go along the bifurcation branches and we will have a look uh, at what's happening, so to say, until we go uh, to the bifurcation point and then it happens. But now, so we are thinking in a different way. So now we are thinking about the trend of our parameters which has a finite time scale. So it's not extremely slow because its time scale of change is comparable with the time scale of the ecosystem it, uh, as well. So now we cannot si simply, so to say, go to our, uh, go to our uh, cartoon picture, so where we have this potential, but we have to think about that we are moving the whole potential landscape with a certain speed. And if we do so, so then we see that our ball, which was originally here, uh, say in the bottom uh, of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the potential, so will move because so the, the landscape is moving. So therefore we have an elongation or a perturbation to our state. So it wants to track the stable state and get back to it. Uh, because of the dissipative time scale, so the intrinsic time scale of the system. So this would be a tracking. That means the change, the rate of environmental change is slow. And therefore, so to say, so it can track the moving stable state because this guy is moving here. So because we are moving the stability landscape. And therefore, so this uh, dashed line would be this point here, but the green line is this perturbation here, so to the to our system, which tries to track this stable state. So, but if the rate of environmental change is high, so then the system can tip and it can move to very different areas in the state space and go to very different trajectories. And in this case, so in this particular system here, so which is a predator prey system. So then this uh, area of state space can be very dangerous. So what does it mean? So we are looking at a predator prey system. So that means we have, uh, so to say the prey, which is eating, so to say some plants and we have the predator. So that means this is a food chain and the predator sits on top and uh, so, so the rate induced transition I'm talking about, and I will explain in a minute, would act on the prey in such a way that it goes below the extinction threshold. 
So it goes to very low uh, abundances and therefore, so to say, the prey collapses. And finally, it would also, the predator which would collapse uh, in a moment. Now let us look at this, how it is done. So we are changing basically the habitat of the system. So we are declining the habitat and look at the impact of global change. So this uh, so decline in habitat can have different uh, reasons. So we can have land use change, we can have climate change. And so we would have a change of the dynamics um, subsequently. But when we look, so to see how we have to, uh, how we have to analyze this dynamics. So then we take, of course, uh, the predator prey dynamics. So this is the prey, this is the predator. So the prey is changing due to growth uh, on the carrying capacity. So this is basically the habitat. And uh, so it's eaten up by the, um, it's e eaten up by the predator. And this should be a minus by the way. So I just noticed this here. Uh, and this is the predator eating up the prey and it's also dying. But now we destruct our carrying capacity. So we make it smaller. And that means, so to say, we destruct basically the quality, quality of our habitat in time. And we do it uh, in a linear fashion, but now we have a third differential equation, which we have to take into account where the rate of the habitat destruction plays an important role. And this is now a non-autonomous system because this gives us an explicit time dependence overall. And what happens is so that if the rate of change is slow, so the system can track the moving, so wait, uh, the moving stable state, which is again the dashed line here. So now we have a three-dimensional parameter space, uh, a state space, the predator, the prey, and the habitat quality. And so we see here, um, so the, uh, the system state tracks more or less the moving equilibrium and gets to this point here. And uh, so, but then, so to say, the prey survives. And uh, so we will end up with a low prey abundance, but still, so to say, we can track here. But so if we make it too fast, and this is only a small change in rate, as you see, so then something completely different happens because our prey will go very fast over this fold here. So, and will end up close to the, uh, to the axis here to very low densities. It goes below uh, the extinction threshold. Of course, mathematically, so it would after some time because the perturbation uh, as we uh, saw here stops after some time and uh, so it will, uh, of course, not um, so not die out. So it will go to very low densities and then finally go back to this state. But in reality, this would not happen because so these densities are extremely small so that they are not making any sense anymore in ecology. So therefore, any small perturbation like any noise would make the prey getting extinct. That means there is a critical rate here. So for which this kind of behavior occurs because we are starting here with the same initial condition. So here the rate is at one value, here the rate is at another value. And in between, there is a change from this behavior to that behavior. And we can compute what this change is because we can identify this critical rate and see that, so there is a curve, so to say, in this state space, which is called the Carnot trajectory, which separates all the initial conditions which are tracking from the initial conditions which are tipping. That means here we have a tipping. So this is a rate induced tipping. All the initial conditions above would give rate induced tipping. The ones below would give tracking. That means this Carnot trajectory would make up the boundary in state space for the initial conditions and separate tracking, tracking from tipping. And so in fact, when we change the rate, then this Carnot trajectory is moving in state space 
And that means if we take the same initial condition, so then, and change the rate, so this guy here, so to say, this boundary would move over this initial condition, going from tracking to tipping, and this would be the critical rate when this canal hits basically here, uh, this point. So that means for each initial condition, there exists a critical rate for this kind of transition. Now we can also even ask whether, because it's an ecological system, we can ask the question, uh, so is then all our ecosystems get lost because we are changing land use and we are having climate change too fast so that this uh, would destroy our ecosystems because the population would die out? No, the answer is no. So because not necessarily at least, because we can also look at adaptation. So these are species and species can adapt. And if we take this into account and we look, so to say for adaptation, which again comes into play. So now we have two equations here, which are in addition, not only the non-autonomous one for the environmental dynamics, but also a trait evolution. So the properties of the species change in adaptation. And that means we have three time scales. We have an ecological time scales, which is so to say the time scale separation here. Uh, so between predator and prey. So we have the time scale of environmental change and we have the evolutionary time scale, which also comes into play. And one can show that indeed, so to say, so this what is called evolutionary rescue. That means that species can adapt fast enough to the changes in the environment. This could lead uh, to, uh, so to say, preventing the tipping. So here we would have rate-induced tipping. If the rate of environmental change um, is, um, is very fast, and if we have no evolution, so we would have here, all this would be rate-induced tipping, and here we would have tracking. But if we increase now the speed of the evolution, then this part becomes larger and larger. And that means adaptation can rescue our population. And that means not everything is lost, but adaptation, which of course is possible for, um, for um, species in the environment, but maybe also for us when we think about um, when we think about other systems where this rate induced tipping can occur. So there are opportunities with um, other timescales which might interact and which might rescue us. And therefore, so this kind of rate induced tipping would not occur. As a final point, I would like to mention now uh, what happens in highly multi-stable systems with rate induced tipping as well. And here I mean systems which have, in general, very complex bifurcation diagrams. And they have fractal and complexly interwoven basin boundaries. And these systems usually possess not only permanent chaos at some point, but also transient chaos. If they have fractal basin boundaries, as I mentioned already previously, there are chaotic settles embedded in it. And when we look at these multi-stable systems in the literature, so then we see that there is a lot of discussion what happens when we change parameters, but usually everything is only reduced to bifurcation tipping. And the time scale of the driver change is neglected so that we have something like a quasi stationary approach. That means our time scale of change of parameters of forcing is very slow. So we are back to bifurcation tipping in the very beginning of the talk, but now we would like to leave this and again choose the way what happens when our time scale of change uh, becomes comparable with the intrinsic time scale, that means the internal time scale or the dissipative dynamics. And let's have a look at an example now, not from climate science. Uh, so this is a pendulum. And uh, so this is periodically forced with a certain amplitude. This is the bifurcation diagram. And so 
we have here permanent chaos. So this would be chaotic attractors. We have the coexistence of many periodic solutions, small chaotic attractors here, boundary crisis there, these chaotic attractors disappear. And uh, so we ask the question now, now we are changing the amplitude and we are changing that again uh, with um, uh, time evolution, so to say, we have again, a non-autonomous system and we let now our driver disappear with a certain rate. That means the pendulum goes to rest because if I have no, no uh, driver anymore, so I'm going through this bifurcation diagram. Uh, so when I uh, look at this at first glance, I would expect I'm going through this bifurcation diagram end up at the resting state. And we do it exponentially fast that we can also compare it with the dissipation rate, which also acts exponentially when we think about eigenvalues. And these are the different scenarios. So that means we go first to this attractor, so which we, uh, we start here, and then we just let the uh, driver disappear. And let's see what happens. And we will look at this with a certain idea which popped up in random dynamical systems, where we look not on a single trajectory, so where in a stochastic system, we would see this blood stuff here, but we would like to look at so-called snapshot attractors or in mathematics, pullback attractors, where we look at many, many different initial conditions and evolve them at the same time. So we are sitting on our chaotic attractor take each point of this chaotic attractor as an initial condition. And for each of these initial conditions, we change the forcing at the same time and look at this. So this is what's happening. So we are now, so to say, switching off. Uh, so with two different scales here, one is a little bit faster than the dissipative time scale and one is a little bit slower. And we see to the right what's happening. And let's see, so what do we see? So we see lots of complicated behavior and we see, oh, so this was not what was in the bifurcation diagram. So because when we now compare, so what we see in the dynamics and we plot on top the dynamics, which we would see for the same kind of C value. So in the bifurcation diagram, we see that this is completely different. These would be periodic solutions what we would see is an extended object, which looks like a chaotic set, slightly different for the different rates, but it has nothing to do with the bifurcation diagram. It does not even reflect it somehow. And the question is why? And what we see is that because of the high, highly multistable system, we have fractal basins of attraction and an embedded chaotic settle. And this embedded chaotic saddle is, so to say, the key for what is happening now uh, in this system. So when we are changing our driving and now we see, so to say, the unstable, um, so the unstable manifold of this chaotic saddle, which we can compute in the frozen in case for this kind of um, of uh, parameter value, and we compare this unstable filamentation or unstable manifold with what we see in the change. And we see it looks very similar. And this tells us we don't see any bifurcation tipping. So if the time scale is relatively fast, so that means this quasi stationarity bidding uh, condition is not fulfilled at all. But now we have to see that, uh, that we even have to think about how fast a chaotic saddle, which is embedded, is disappearing. It's not only the dissipative time scale which, which, uh, uh, which counts, but it's also the escape rate from the chaotic saddle. So, and this brings me to the very end. So I have explained four tipping phenomena, bifurcation, noise induced and shock induced, which I would call the classical critical transitions, but there is also rate induced, which is quite new. And this is a bifurcation of truly non-autonomous systems. And where we have really to take into account the internal timescales of the system, 
the dissipative time scales, and even maybe escape times from the chaotic saddle. And we have co to compare them with the time scale of the driving, because this is the key to understand rate induced tipping. And this rate induced tipping depends strongly on the initial conditions. And the bottom line of all this is we see that now we are trained for a very long time, all the time to look at the tractors and their bifurcation diagrams. But now we have learned that we should not look only at attractors, but saddles and their stable and unstable manifolds. They are of equal importance when we would like to understand tipping in natural systems. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ulrike, for this very exciting and lively talk. And the best sign for this is that no one of the participants left. They all were on, <laughs> on site all the time. But now we have time for questions. Uh, maybe Sujit or your people can help to yeah, identify. Yeah, definitely. So uh, everyone can type their questions on the uh, Q&A. Uh, I guess it takes one or two minutes for people to get their questions up. Maybe the panelists can ask some questions by the time the Q&A box opens up. Maybe I, I can ask a question, uh, Ulrike. You mentioned uh, in the rather beginning these different types of perturbations, and mm -hmm. one is fluctuation and the other shocks. But if you have such uh, a bit strange kind of noise as levy or so, then you have a combination of both. Have you also considered this? Uh, we didn't. Uh, but uh, so, of course, this is uh, under consideration. So we haven't done anything uh, like this. But uh, so I know that, for instance, Valerio Lucarini is working on this. So. Uh, working on, say, noise induced transitions with Levy noise. And there, so to say, so I have shown in my, um, in my presentation, <clears throat> uh, let me go back here. Uh, so I have shown you the noise induced transitions. So it's here. And uh, so, so we see that there is another stability measure which you have to take into account. So this is the mean escape time. And the mean escape time, as it is shown here, so this is only uh, valid for Gaussian noise. For living noise, you would, you would get something completely different. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a different scaling. And uh, so this is, uh, this is under investigation. So you get, you get different answers from the system. Uh, so, because it scales differently with the noise strength, so these kind of transitions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fidel, for a very nice and interesting talk. Uh, you talked about weak perturbation and strong perturbation, but what about intermediate per perturbation? So, what are the effects of uh, uh, Intermediate perturbation. Do you see anything interesting? Uh, I would, I would, uh, so to say, consider the intermediate ones, so to say, the same as the as the larger ones. So I mean, uh, so there, so the small perturbations we can, of course, uh, deal with as what is linear stability analysis. So, but yeah. then of course, mathematics tells us so that if we have small perturbations and uh, this is usually assumed to be in a neighborhood and the mathematical theorem starts not tell us how large the neighborhood is going to be. And uh, so they tell us, and this is what we have to expect. We can use the eigenvalues for larger perturbations. So which are still um, say not reaching the basin boundary. So because the basin boundary makes of course rather large differences. Um, uh, we could have uh, uh, such things li like, uh, so these kind of rate induced transitions, if we, if we uh, now shift our system uh, to a region 
uh, in state space where the, the system becomes very vulnerable, then of course I can imagine that also other things happen. But uh, so, but this would be again only in non-autonomous systems where we can where we can deal with this, but not with the classical with the classical things. I see. <clears throat> okay. You also talked about moving equilibrium. So what is this moving equilibrium? Uh, so when we go back here, just a moment, I will. Uh, so when we when we look at this, um, so when we look here now at this uh, stability landscape, and we are moving the stability landscape. And if we do so, then we are moving also our equilibrium. When we say this in terms of, uh, of say, um, equations, so then, so K of T, so this is, this is basically, of course, a time evolution. So here, because we are talking about something piecewise linear. So then what we have is basically the trajectory of our carrying capacity of our parameter is the rate times t. It's a linear change. And in principle, so we can compute the steady states of this, so the equilibrium again, but now it depends on a k which depends on t. That means this equilibrium moves quasi stationary, so to say, it moves. And so this that, movement that is, is the move of this equilibrium. So that is not really an equilibrium because it changes with time. Yes, in this sense, yes. So therefore it's a quasi equilibrium, if you like. So because it's not an equilibrium in the classical sense, I totally agree. So, and uh, so therefore one should maybe better say it's a quasi equilibrium, but to make clear what we mean, so to say, we just say, okay, so this is the equilibrium, but it moves in time. So because I can put K of T, t in here and then I see how it moves. So can we talk about this kind of equilibrium for non-autonomous systems? Uh, uh, yes, so because uh, these are the attractors you would see in the non-autonomous systems. So because these are equivalent to what is called a pullback attractor in mathematics. So because also the concept of an attractor, which we are used to in say autonomous systems can be extended to non-autonomous systems as well. And uh, so, so- What happened in the case of Duffing oscillator? Uh, for the Duffing oscillator, so you would see these as well. So you would, you could be able to compute also the um, the pullback attractors for the periodic solutions I showed in my um, in my diagram, so to say, in my bifurcation diagram. The bifurcation diagram, of course, is is computed, so to say, always for fixed parameters. So in the non-autonomous case, but uh, so you could, in principle, compute all these attractors also in a time, de a time dependent fashion. And this would complicate, of course, the situation, but would, uh, would be very interesting to do. So we haven't done it, but uh, for instance, Peter Ashwin, uh, so he has developed methods how to compute this kind of pullback attractors, uh, for instance, for periodic solutions. So this is possible, but it complicates life, of course. But this is what one should do uh, so if one is interested in the fate of periodic solutions as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Number of questions in the Q&A box. Can you see them or should I read them all? Uh, yes, I can see them. You can answer them one after the other. So, okay, so, so the first one, uh, the first question is, so to say, um, uh, whether the network approach captures the nonlinear interactions terms, yes. So, because uh, these plant pollinator networks, these are in fact 
nonlinear differential equations, which are in the background. Uh, so which I haven't written down here. So because these are interaction networks. So these are um, compared to the networks which we would have uh, in, in, the, in the power grids where we have nodes where there, there is a certain dynamics and then there is basically a linear coupling uh, between them. Uh, so, uh, or, or if I look at uh, such things where I have say nonlinear systems acting on a node and uh, with a linear coupling. So this is one type of network you can think of. But another type of network is what is called these plant pollinator networks or also food webs would be of the same kind. These are interaction networks where the network structure comes uh, about only uh, so about the interaction between the different species and from these interaction terms you draw the network and uh, so uh, chaoticity is um, is also chaotic motion is part of the business uh, not always uh, so but for the for climate examples this can be uh, so that we would have, uh, we could have also uh, chaotic states there, even chaotic settles in climate, uh, in, in the climate system. So this has been shown, for instance, by Valerio Lucarini and co-workers that chaoticity can also play a role here. So, okay, so then we come to the next question. And uh, so there are two of them. So, Hello, what is, so what could be another example of uh, escape time from a chaotic saddle time scale? Um, so the escape time is, so to say, the time. So, so I'm not quite sure I understand the, the question correctly, but the escape time means that if you have a chaotic saddle, it's a saddle. That means it's unstable in itself. And the time you need uh, yeah. to, to leave the saddle. Uh, so because it's a chaotic set, you dwell on it for a while, but then because it's unstable, you will leave um, uh, afterwards. And this time scale, so to say, is important uh, because uh, each of the trajectories which is reaching the chaotic saddle will leave it at another time. And so this is a mean time scale, which also plays a very important role. Um, so in solid earth geophysics, uh, I don't know any example for the moment, uh, so which would have been treated in this kind of, uh, in this kind of say, um, framework, but I can imagine that, um, that this could happen uh so because an earthquake would be a large perturbation and if you if you would look for instance at shock tipping for a building or so then i could imagine that one can of course analyze it in in uh, in the same way Ulrike? yeah i'm shaman uh, yeah. so i have a question so yes. so you, you have assumed the path let us say parameter of the carrying capacity is varying either exponentially or linearly. You, you consider the cases, two cases, but it could also vary periodically, right? With a definite frequency. So yes. Is, so is there any study going on such as how the, whether it may lead to the tipping here? It's the kind uh, of red tipping. Yes, there is. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, there is. Uh, so, and uh, so this has been done by, um, so, okay, so I, uh, so I forgot the last name, maybe someone can help me. Uh, it's Rachel um, Kuski, yeah. Uh, Rachel oh. Kuski was considering uh, the interplay between rate induced and noise induced tipping and compared it uh, so also with the periodically forcing, so to say. Huh? 
so so where you can you can have rate induced tipping basically in a bistable system you tip from one yeah. tractor to another one so this has been studied uh, and uh, so there is a shift in bifurcations involved so to say when you combine these two mm. so uh, so there are papers about this but this is the only at the moment where so the only study at the moment i know mm -hmm. and, and not very old one right it's more recent uh, it's not very old i think the paper is maybe from 21 or even 22 so so but this is what you what you can find on on the website okay mm -hmm. yeah thank you so then i should continue with the questions in the chat Mm -hmm. uh, whether B tipping is a specific type of R tipping. Um, in principle, you can say so in a way. So, because if you make the rate slower and slower, you would end up with what a B tipping would be. So, uh, probably one can even figure out uh, so the rate um until which you would see or so this is also some some rate basically where you would reach the cliff or where you would go over the cliff because when you do rate induced tipping in a bistable system which i was not talking about so because for all my examples so the rate induced tipping at least for the one where i explained what rate induced tipping is um, I was assuming that uh, so my parameter change does not involve any bifurcation. So we have one stable state in this predator prey system, and there is no bifurcation involved. But you can, of course, also think about rate induced tipping in the bistable case where you go through this kind of hysteresis loop. So let me go back to the hysteresis loop. Now, so you are changing your parameter very slow so then you go up to the cliff and drop down so the whole system or if you would do it with a certain rate which is larger you would overshoot and you would end up somewhere here instead of here and of course you would so this is probably a gradual change it's not a critical change i would guess so but if you decrease uh, then your rate, you would finally end up at bifurcation tipping and you could probably make an estimate how slow your parameter change has to be to be considered as a bifurcation tipping. So the next question from Camilo. So hi, Camilo. Uh, so we have not thought about applications in social science or economical systems, but I'm sure uh, there will be some popping up soon because I know that several people work on this. Uh, also to look um, at social systems and also at uh, systems in economy um, and uh, therefore uh, I would closely follow the literature because I have seen uh, only in talks so far that people were, were uh, just talking to try to apply this also to social systems. But this is in the very beginning, uh, only outlines of the talks. And so I haven't seen papers about it, at least not uh, so, which is closely related to what we have done. So there is a next question. Yeah, when we go to extremely fast rates compared to the system time scale, this is an interesting question. And uh, I don't think that many people have done it, but so the fastest rate you can do, and this is what has been done, not really the transition, but, uh, but what people have, been done uh, so far is that if you do it extremely fast, then you end up with something which is a shock. So if I change my uh, if I change my parameter with an extremely fast rate, then this is a kind of heavy side function. So it's steady. So on uh, on 
uh, basically, so uh, it's steady for some time, then it's jumping to a new parameter value. So jumping to a certain uh, other value, and then it's steady again. In ecology, this has been termed a press disturbance, and this is similar to a shock. And this, of course, has been done, but so far I haven't seen that it brings um, it brings additional, say, um, additional new phenomena uh, compared to what is already known from rate-induced tipping and shock tipping. So this gives you basically the same result, but uh, so I think it's still an open question. So because usually people use it only for comparison, never for a real study. Yeah, so the, the escape time scale is very difficult to get in an experimental system. Um, even though, so to say from data, probably from observations, if you know that there is a chaotic motion, uh, so this is what you could do because you could look at time series and you could look at how long does it take before a new um, qualitative dynamics pops up. This has been done already. So because uh, these type of uh, transient time scales, because these are transient, so the um, so these chaotic setters are not nothing else than chaotic transients, and these transient time scales. So this has been studied in hydrodynamics a lot. Uh, so where you can also look at how long does it take, so to say to get back to a laminar state from a turbulent one. So this is where all these ideas from, um, from uh, uh, so hydrodynamics came from. So which we took uh, as, so to say, role models for developing this shock-induced tipping. And uh, so you can, you can do it for, for any experimental observations when you go from one dynamical state to another dynamical state, you can just measure how long does it take. And this gives you a kind of transient time scale. And the mean value would be something like this escape time if there is chaos involved in between. So there is a next question. Um, this is also an interesting question, and uh, so um, this has so there, there is not much what have been done except early warning signals. So so there are certain approaches already trying to uh, trying to come up with ideas. So how to classify these kind of abrupt shifts in the dynamics? Uh, even though we don't know the system which is in the background. And we have basically no idea whether it's noise induced, bifurcation induced. Uh, so what is there? These early warning signals, however, are only developed uh, for very simple, uh, so very simple bifurcation. It's not even clear for all bifurcations because most of these early warning signals take into account um, so that the approach of bifurcation, which is for a steady state, so it's not even for periodic solutions, basically mostly it's for steady states, and then you can think about the variance, uh, and already for periodic solutions, these early warning signals do not signal the approach to the bifurcation, so, and therefore, um, it is quite an open field, I would say, at the moment, how to do all this, what I was talking about from time series. But I think it's very much needed to have this and to make a distinction. So whether it's noise induced or bifurcation induced, but early warning signals would only signal bifurcation induced tipping because what is signaled is the increase in the variance or the change in autocorrelation 
and the, 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 the variance change is related to that the damping of the de deterministic system goes to zero because the eigenvalues at the bifurcation go to zero. And uh, so this gives rise to this rising variance as you approach the bifurcation. But for many other bifurcations, this is not known and not uh, so and, and early warning signals uh, so are not working for saturn node bifurcations, for instance, for uh, um, for periodic solutions, or at least it's not so clear because you have ghost solutions, which are still, uh, so to say, noticeable, even though the uh, after the saddle node bifurcation, the, um, the uh, periodic solutions have disappeared, but you can still see the ghost of them. So therefore, the variance would still be rising or falling. So or doing something else so that you cannot say that there is a transition or there is there is no transition. So this blows the bifurcation. And uh, so for many others like global bifurcations and so nothing is known about early warning signals. So there has been a paper, I think about rate induced transitions where you can, you can uh, identify also some early warning signals, but I would say we are far away from uh, having good enough methods for the wide var variety of different tipping phenomena. Um, so at the moment, which would give us a clear picture. The only, the only ones where we have a clear picture is the saddle node bifurcation of steady states. And uh, so there we have a pretty clear picture for many others this is an open question, how to really deal with this from data. So uh, in higher dimensional system, how one can determine a rate sensitive parameter? Uh, we have not determined it in a higher dimensional system. So there it was just one parameter. So where we, where we looked at this pendulum, uh, so we haven't uh, checked all of them, all the parameters, but I would suggest in a hard dimensional system. And uh, so really to, um, to take first of all for changing the rate, the bifurcation parameter where you see interesting behavior already, so to say on the bifurcation level, and then try this one whether this could be a rate sensitive parameter, but it's not for sure so that this is going to work. But uh, so in the systems we have checked, mostly I could have taken any of the parameters, it would work. So it would uh, show another rate induced transition, but uh, so, so it, it would change uh, the bifurcation a diagram and therefore it would also work as a rate induced parameter, but not all of them. So it's a kind of trial and error, but I would start particularly the, with the bifurcation parameter. Yeah, is COVID uh, some kind of tipping? Um, I'm not sure. So, but if I think about COVID as a kind of um, as a kind of, say, excitable system. So if we would have as a, so to say, a breakdown of a pandemic, if I can model it uh, in terms of an excitable system, so then, um, so there would be uh, a possibility to see maybe rate induced tipping there because for excitable systems, one can show that rate induced tipping occurs. But of course it depends on how you really model this. And uh, since I'm not an expert in, in, um, in diseases or in say epidemiological modeling, uh, I would say that, uh, so I would not be uh, able to really judge this um, because uh, so, um, whether this can be um, interpre interpreted as a, as a tipping, I'm not sure. 
So how are tippings related to Rene Tom's elementary catastrophes? Uh, so of course, Rene Tom's elementary catastrophes occur everywhere where we have bifurcations and particularly uh, so the cusp catastrophe, which is the one which would basically, so this is the simplest of Tom's uh, catastrophe. The, no, the simplest is the fault, but the next, the next one would be the cusp where these two um, saddle node bifurcations merge. So this would, uh, this would also be, of course, important uh, so to consider because this would make this, this by stability region disappear. So therefore we would have, if we would have a, um, a second parameter because for this to happen so that the two set of nodes in this hysteresis behavior, so the two set of nodes would merge only if you vary a second bifurcation parameter, but then your, um, your bifurcation tipping could disappear if you have two of these bifurcations uh, happening at the same time, the two saddle nodes. But this has not been studied as far as I know, but is surely related to uh, René uh, Tom's bifurcation uh, theory, so these catastrophes, because it would involve the cusp. Um, what is the difference between explosive transitions and tipping? So I'm not quite sure what you mean with an explosive transition. Um, so because if you think about say something like explosive synchronization, this has not been studied at all in this kind of say uh, type of approaches. Uh, therefore, I would not be sure so one can really uh, say it as tipping in a general sense. Of course, you have a transition from one state, so where things are maybe all this desynchronized and something which is, which is synchronized, this would be um, a transition for sure. But for the moment, I don't see how this would be how, how we would be able to put this into this classification. Uh, so I was talking about, and uh, so therefore, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, so to say, whether we could deal with it uh, in this kind of, um, in this kind of, uh, say, classification. So uh, yeah, so I would take the dissipative time scale. So if we if we vary the bifurcation parameter at a finite rate, so then we have a time scale which is related with this say external change. So which would change the bifurcation parameter, but the other time scale to compare with would be definitely the dissipation time scale. That means how fast my system would go back to the bifurcation diagram to my branch here. So if I would again uh, discuss it in terms of the hysteresis, so then my, um, my parameter, so to say, I would change so that I can go um, along the bifurcation branch and would go up to the, um, up to the bifurcation and then, so I would tip. But to see the rate induced transition also when I do it with a certain rate, I have to consider how fast my system goes back to the bifurcation branch here because my parameter uh, change would change my system in such a way that it goes away from the, from the bifurcation path. But then, uh, so to say it, so the, the counterpart is the dissipative time scale, how fast I would go back. And if I go back fast enough, I would, I would have this bifurcation tipping. But if I'm not fast enough, then this is the time scale to compare with. This is what I would take. And in principle, this is also the, the, the time scale of the critical slowing down because the time scale of the critical slowing down is the inverse of the 
of the largest eigenvalue, which is the one which goes to zero. And this is exactly this time scale, so which we have in mind. So, So we come back to the extreme, uh, so the extremely fast rate. So this is indeed a shock. And this shock would bring you, so to say, uh, probably, so if the shock, uh, so is on, if the shock happens to be um, affecting the state variables, we would probably go immediately to another basin of attraction. But if the shock is applied to the parameters, which I also can do, then I'm ending up in a completely different uh, part of the bifurcation diagram. And then I would, of course, see the state which would correspond to this part of the bifurcation diagram. So uh, I hope this answers the question. Uh, and so now we have another question on consequences in neuron dynamics. Um, so we have not looked at neuron dynamics, to be honest. So at least not uh, with respect to with respect to tipping. Um, and of course, in neurodynamics, what would be, for instance, the external driver? So which we would have in mind, uh, so to, to basically have this bifurcation diagram here and have this, this kind of either having alternative states or look at rate induced transitions. But I think it's an interesting question. So I'm not sure that anyone has, has looked at this surely of course in terms of bifurcation yes because this is old stuff say the classical bifurcations yes you you can find literature uh, en masse i would say but i haven't seen anything on rate induced and shock induced transitions in neurodynamics so far but it's an interesting thought so one has to think about where this could be of importance but um so uh, we haven't done it, and I have not seen any literature in this direction. I think we are finished with the questions. I think there are a lot of questions for 45 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. And I also want to thank you for the very nice talk and all the questions, uh, all the answers to all the questions. And I also want to thank the audience. They are still there. Uh, um, do you have a question? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I just want to have one comment from her. Thanks, Ulrike, for the nice talk. So from, from your comments on early warning signals, can I understand that all these type of transitions are not associated with critical slowing down? Only bifurcation induced is having critical slowing down. Is that correct to say? Um, I would not go that far in my statement because... Uh, so far, critical slowing down should happen, uh, so to say, for all bifurcations where the real parts of the eigenvalues go to zero. Correct. So this is what I would guess, but this is not all bifurcations. So because we have local bifurcations and we have global bifurcations, and the global bifurcations, of course, are not related to, to this kind of eigenvalue business. So we cannot uh, compute the eigenvalues which tell this to us. And for the more complex bifurcations, so where, where it's not say steady states, so which are involved in the bifurcation, even though we know that the eigenvalues go to zero for the, um, for the, uh, for the steady states, but of course we have other eigenvalues for the bifurcations of periodic solutions because there the eigenvalues have to cross, uh, for instance, uh, the, um, so if you think about this in the Poincaré section, then the eigenvalues have to cross uh, the um, unit circle uh, in the eigenvalue space. So that means the eigenvalues have to have modulus one for this bifurcation. Right. 
and this is for maps. And uh, so, so this is a different situation. So therefore, all this critical slowing down stuff has to be extended to these kind of, of bifurcations. And as far as I know, there's not much done. So uh, which, which has really addressed this question. So how critical slowing down uh, works uh, in this, in, in maps to get into this classification. So for the simpler ones, this has been studied a lot because of course, most of the examples which have been studied are steady states. Okay. But for the more complex attractors like periodic solutions, tori, or even so you can think about uh, something like the global bifurcations, which lead to the appearance or disappearance of chaotic attractors. This has not been studied. And um, so therefore we have no idea what really uh, is, or at least I have no idea. So maybe if someone can, can help me in the audience, that's fine. I would love to see that, uh, but so far, so the so what has been done in the literature is quite limited to certain cases and many other cases are not addressed so far mm -hmm. anyway for noise induced transitions and shock induced transitions you don't expect a, a critical slowing now no not at all okay so from that it's not working for noise induced transition this has been shown in a paper i don't remember uh, so what paper it was, uh, but definitely for shock induced transition, no. Okay, okay, thank so, you. So there is no critical slowing down, nothing like this. And I would not expect even to see yeah, it. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, and thanks to the audience, they're still there. And we'll... Uh, uh, close now. And the next seminar will be given by Professor Ram Ramaswamy on the 27th of February. That's the last Monday of February. Thank you all and have a nice rest of the day. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.